something I don't think gets discussed nearly enough is the purpose of education, or as you say in your book, the purposes of education. I think without these discussions and without a clear sense of purpose and direction, how can we possibly know what and how we should be teaching to children to lead what we might call the good life? Mm. And in your book, and you've just mentioned it earlier, you keep coming back to this idea of developing character and, and habits of mind. So could you expand a bit on what you see as maybe some of the purposes of education and why character and habits of mind matter? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think that to start from the idea that there are multiple purposes for education, one of which is one of which is to transmit bodies of useful knowledge. Mm -hmm. Nobody in their right mind denies that. Another of which, which often gets closely allied with the first one, is to help kids get the grades that will get them into universities or apprenticeships, which open doors, which open a range of possibilities for the kinds of life, particularly working life, which they're going to lead. At least, at least there's, the, there's those two purposes of education. But work by uh, James Heckman and others, for example, who's a Nobel Prize winning economist, uh, American at the University of Chicago, has shown very clearly that the grades, uh, the knowledge based grades and tests of, are in, important for getting you through certain important gateways. There are kind of initiation rights that, that give you access to pastures new. Mm. But whether you flourish and prosper once you're through those gateways is determined not so much by the grades that you got. They've done their job. Your A-levels did their job by then. Whether you flourish at your, you know, further education college or in your apprenticeship or at your university is much more power and on into your life is much more powerfully predicted by the possession of certain character traits or character strengths like many of them are are very familiar to us like perseverance mm -hmm. like the ability to concentrate and to be focused in what you're doing like the ability to be convivial or genial or friendly in your relationships with other people um, like your ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes to adopt multiple perspectives and so on. Mm -hmm. So these are not kind of sentimental, romantic ideas. These come out of vast body bodies of data churned about what predicts people's success in life or satisfaction with their lives. So what I call the, you know, the third compartment of what we're dealing with in school, there's knowledge, there's skills, and then there's this other compartment of attitudes and dispositions and habits of mind and character strengths and call them what it call them whatever you like mm. all of those are predictive uh, ought to be in play as multiple purposes mm. the way you teach depends on which of those outcomes you bear in mind so for example if all you're interested in is grades test results knowledge transmission and university entrance if that's where your your rubric stops as it were then direct instruction can be a useful and effective way of teaching but if you're also interested in, in the development of characteristics like imagination or curiosity or collaboration then you must ask yourself is direct instruction still the optimal method of teaching once you broaden the spectrum of outcomes that you value not just in words but in reality mm. the trouble with a, with a lot of schools is that they you know every school says it cares about this other stuff preparing youngsters for a lifetime of learning or ensuring that all young people fulfill their potential every school on its website yeah. says something in addition to knowledge transmission and test scores everybody knows that's not sufficient it's necessary but it's not sufficient 
So when you look at the evidence, there are, there are, there are a, a large number of studies now, some of them laboratory-based studies, some of them real-world studies, which show that if you are going to take seriously outcomes like the development of resilience, empathy, imagination, concentration, collaboration, and so on, then direct instruction is not the optimal pedagogy. So that, there is evidence, there's a lovely little book by an American academic called Yong Zhao called What Works May Hurt, hmm. where he looks at what, the, what he calls the side effects of different ways of teaching. And in that little book, there's a whole chapter on direct instruction, which looks at the research but shows that what works for literal knowledge transmission can have a toxic effect on the development of resilience or creativity or curiosity. I've just been reading a couple of, couple of new papers recently. Here's one you may or may not be able to read. I was just reading this a couple of days ago. It was published this year. The title is Children Persist Less When Adults Take Over. Mm. Right? In other words, yeah. resilience is put at risk when adults are being too bossy, when they explain everything to you up front, when there's no room left for your curiosity or your discovery or your experimentation. Mm -hmm. So if we care, once we open up our minds to taking seriously this, the full rainbow, if you like, of desirable outcomes of education, then we have to rethink our pedagogy. And then the direct instruction in the knowledge rich curriculum is found limited and wanting. Mm. Yeah, you, you reference um, Alison Gopnik's book, The Gardener and the Carpenter. Yes, lovely book. Yeah, and I read that as, as a parent, um, uh, but I also obviously thought this, this relates directly to my teaching in class. And that experiment, I think she cites it in her book, where a teacher, there's a, a toy, a new mm -hmm. toy, and, and the teacher, they take different approaches. One teacher presses something, was like, oh, and it has this certain reaction. And it's as if she has just stumbled upon it by accident. And then she gets the children to play with that toy. And then the same teacher, another group of kids, shows the children exactly when you press this button, this is what happens and gives them the toy. Mm -hmm. And then am I right in thinking that the first group of children, they kind of investigate the toy more because the teacher demonstrated, look what happens by accident and they explore it and they find more creative and novel uses with it. Yes. Whereas the kind of direct instruction, this is how this toy works. The children, you know, played with it in exactly the way they were shown. I just find that yeah. fascinating. Yes, absolutely. And that's like a sort of morality tale for, for thinking about the different kinds of pedagogies. And they have pros and cons, you mm. know, they all have pros and cons. And where the, where the interesting action is happening is in the middle. You know, sometimes you need to explain things up front. Sometimes, as in the, this, this other paper that I've just been reading, it's called DIY Productive Failure, Boosting Performance in an Undergraduate Biology Course. So the experiment you were referring to by Elizabeth Bonowitz is with little children. Mm. This is going right up to undergraduates which shows that if you're given a tricky task that you could have a go at, its technical word is called the grapple problem, mm -hmm. right? It's something that's beyond your current level of capability, but not much beyond it. Mm. So you can have some ideas about how you might go about it. If you're given a chance to grapple with something and probably fail, then when you're taught whatever it is you're taught, you retain it much more reliably and learn it much more deeply than if you didn't have that grapple time at the beginning so okay. the hybrid we're back to your hybrid aren't we? Mm. you know and you know it's just it doesn't help to try and boil things down as einstein said to make things more simple than they than they need to be